In this chapter, we are going to have a look at how you can integrate a moving object and a moving camera. And that is something that you always have to do if you also want to integrate some 3D environments and a 3D object into some footage. So in the last chapter that was easy because we only had this moving object. But as soon as you want to have the environment also, then you need to track both the camera and the object. And the example that we will be using is something that we will probably also have to do for Project Mango because here I'll show you some concept art. So we have this person and he is wearing some blaster guns and that is something that we most likely will have to do in 3D. So in that case we have to track the arms and also we have to track the camera. Now the camera is probably easy, you can add some markers into the scene, you can place some objects that are easy to track, but the arm is something that, well, it does have some perspective and some depth, but since it is all skin, it will be hard to track. And even if you put little crosses onto your skin on the arm, it might still be hard to track because there is just not very much depth. And because of that, I came up with this weird tracking device, so this is something that you can put on your arm. It is made of like wood and some uh, stuff here, some sticks and especially these green and red balls. And if you put them on, then of course you would have to mask them out. But if the object that you put onto this arm is big enough, then you do not even have to paint out anything. You can just put the object onto this arm and you won't see these markers. And what these do is to provide the very much needed perspective and depth information for the solver to create a 3D track from that. Because if you look at the environment, that of course is very easy to track. If you play back here, so that is there's a lot of perspective in it. There's a lot to track, so that will be very easy. But this is a really tiny space that is covered here by these elements. So even that might be hard to solve. So compare all the perspective and depth information of this video to this very small device, then even that will be hard to track. So I've built that with green and red balls because with that it will be easier to tell them apart if they cross each other. Because with the movement that is something that is always happening. For example, here in this area, now, because there is a green and red marker, it is easier to tell them apart than one of these balls already fell off, this little spot here. But even with the different colors, there are some situations where they cross each other, for example, here. So there are still some challenges. So let's go to Blender and open this shot. So in Blender, open this clip, which you can find in footage, object tracking, gun and then it will be this one open the clip alt a for playback so let's see how far we want to go so i think the first shot is here and you can see that rob who is currently here working as an intern he's a really great actor so this shooting is really convincing i think so he shoots once and then he raises his hand shoots twice and let's see how far we want to go with that. So maybe the shot, let's make the end frame 320. E for end frame, cache that into the RAM. All right, so like that, go to frame one and then we will start tracking that. So go to tracking settings and then maybe we can start to try with the default settings. So 11 and 61, so control left click and maybe we will have to scale it up because it doesn't really fit to this ball. So scale it up just a little bit like that and then L and then track frame by frame. So Alt right arrow and then try to make sure that this is really always in the center. Because especially with object tracking where you don't have that much perspective, so all the information is just on a very small space, you really have to be careful and try to get a really decent track because every error will be much worse than if you have some pixels off if you do the camera tracking on a much larger scale. So in this case you really try to get it accurate. 
so there it fails G to bring it back on track alt right arrow and that really can take a while especially because here there are some people crossing that so that might be something that gives some errors then here it starts sliding off a little bit so in that case I would move it up back on track scale it down and then track backwards just to try to really smoothly transition that between these different positions so here continue on tracking manually adjust it and so on so this can really take a while of course I don't want to <laughs> bore you with um, tracking everything so I will just do some of these there you've got some problems So bring that back here, Alt, right click. And now you really have to be careful that the marker doesn't jump. All right, so that looks pretty solid. Okay, so let's go back to frame one and then continue. Maybe with this red one. And for the red one, I also think that it might help if we limit that to this color. So if you go into display, switch it to black and white, then this red color is very near to the gray color of the floor. But if you disable the green color and the blue color, then there is much more contrast between this red foreground and the gray background. Maybe let me hide this marker with H. So with just the red channel, here is much more contrast between the foreground and the background than with the other channels enabled. And in some cases that will be helpful for tracking. So we could also go ahead and let's say we want to track all the red markers first. So in the tracking settings, we can just disable green and blue so that we, when we add a marker, that we will only track the red color. So also here in the track preview you can see that because of this preset only the red channel is enabled. And as I've mentioned before this in the track panel is independent from the settings in the display. So this is really just for display. You can do anything you want here it will have no effect on tracking. But disabling single channels up here that will have an effect on tracking. So let's see if we can Maybe you think that. So let's see if that has an impact. I'm sure it will have an impact. I'm not sure if it will really help. So in some cases um, you might think it helps, but then in fact it doesn't because of other reasons. But let's see what happens if we track this. So that is pretty solid. Maybe also we can scale it up just a bit. So here it is a bit dangerous because here we have the red balls in front of each other. So in that case, maybe we should enable both or at least let me enable both in the display and also turn off black and white so that we can really see the colors because I think that will also help us to really make sure that we are tracking the correct marker because by seeing the color at least I can see better what's going on. So again here it is a little bit confusing which marker is which one but I think that this should be here just by the motion. So in this case the darker marker is this one here in the foreground and the brighter marker is in the background. And because it is so dark, uh, eventually having the red channel disabled also doesn't make a real difference here. Or does it? Ah, maybe it does. I don't know. Let's see. It still is a little bit tricky to track that. Yeah, but it's definitely the one in the foreground. Okay, so this is really tedious and eventually setting it to track the previous frame might help. It also can always lead to sliding. So let's see what happens in this case. 
See, it doesn't really help. All right, so that should be okay. It looks fine. And now I will track the rest of these balls and then come back. Okay, so you can already see how incredibly tedious this work can be. And especially then, if you realize, oh, I've inserted all these markers for the camera object, then it can be really annoying. At least a few weeks ago, it would have been very annoying because then you would have to do the work all over again. But luckily now we have an operator to copy the tracks from one object to another. So if you just start tracking, and then you realize, like me, then you have been tracking the camera object when in fact you wanted to track the object object. Then you can first create the object and all your tracks are lost. But in the camera object where these tracks have been added because we didn't do anything like that in the first place, then you can select everything with A and then hit spacebar and type copy and now you have the operator copy tracks. You can click that and in object you can paste them by typing paste. Paste tracks and now you've got your tracks and in the camera object we can just erase all these because we will add some different tracks later. So in the object we can now continue on tracking the object. So, for example, we can now also go ahead and track some of these white corners here. They should be easy to track and we do need them because just these few markers are not enough. Because you know you have to have 8 markers at least to get a decent track or to get a track at all. But currently we can only see 1, 2, 3, 4 markers, or 4 of these balls. Then there is this tiny little spot where the ball is missing that I will also track. But that is still not enough. And for that we can also track these white corners here, also these white balls on the wooden sticks that I've used to attach the sticks with the balls on it. So we can track that as well. And also because Rob has been holding his hand very stiff, I think that we can even track some of his fingers here, maybe the shadow, because it seems as if he would have really not moved his hand at all, which is very good. So I think we can track that, but for this I will just skip that and when I'm finished I will come back. Okay, so I've tracked a bunch of stuff and it is quite a bit and it was a lot of work and I'm not even sure if this will work because especially here in the last part there is so much motion blur and so many occluding markers that this will be really hard to solve. And actually I think I will just stop this right at frame 155 because after that there is so much motion blur and this will be really tricky. So in order to speed things up and not to make this too extensive, let's just solve from frame 1 to 155. That will be hard enough. So in the timeline I just press E for end frame, also select everything and then hit Alt T so that only we have to care about the first 155 frames. Then this is really quite a mess. So it's hard to see what happens. So in this case, it might be good to use the thin marker display. So in the marker display, you can enable thin markers and that is a little bit easier to see. And now we should also have a look at the curves. So hit Z and then zoom in to see if everything is all right. And so far it looks okay. 
Some things are a bit tricky and especially here where these two markers occluding each other, that is really tricky. Okay, but let's see what we can do. I've shot with the Canon 550D, so in order to solve that, we can go to the camera data, set this to the Canon 550D, so that we've got the correct sensor size, and I believe I've shot with 18 millimeters, I'm not sure. But what I know is that if my camera is set to 18 millimeters, then the lens distortion on K1 is something around minus dot one or one five or something like that. So let's try with minus dot one. And we could already start solving, and actually, let's do that. So A to collapse the marker, and then solve the object motion. And we got quite a bad solve error, so 4 or almost 5, that is definitely not acceptable. So this really doesn't look right. But we know that one way to get around that is to try to get better keyframes. Because if you look at frame 1 and frame 30, not a lot is happening here. So maybe we should try to get a keyframe where we have more perspective shift, for example, frame 102. So keyframe A is one, that might be all right. So let's try frame 102. Shift S. Now we are at 2.9, which is a little bit better, but still not great. Okay, so apparently something's not quite right yet. And we have quite a mess here, but that is also where he shoots. So that is a very fast motion. So some problems are expected. Then let's have a look at this spike. What is that? So, okay, th so that is this one, which is being occluded here in this part of the shot. So to easier concentrate on that, I just select this marker and then hit Shift H to hide everything else. And that makes it easier to really concentrate on this specific marker. So we are here and I thought I could track that while it is being occluded. Maybe I can try to smooth out this spike. So all the others are doing that kind of motion. So chances are that this marker also should be doing something more in that direction. So maybe we can even fix that from the curve view. So here I can right click on this little circle and then hit G Y to only move it along this axis and thereby trying to smooth it out. But also apparently when I do that, that has an impact on the neighboring marker, but by manipulating both of them, at least I get a smooth curve. But of course I cannot be certain what exactly is happening because it is occluded. So eventually I should just disable that marker from here to there. But because it is also enabled before that, because before it has not been occluded. So in that case, I can use the box select tool which is new. I have not been able to do that a few days ago, but now that is a new addition, so that is a new tool. So now we can select a bunch of these single tracked marker points, or these single frames, with a B key. So B for box select, select everything from here to there, and then hit Shift D to disable all of these frames. And let's see if that helps. Shift S. And it's not that much better. But one thing that is quite promising is that we don't have any spikes here. So eventually it's just a matter of the wrong focal length. So because I really don't know the exact lens distortion and the exact focal length, we can get this information by solving the camera first. So I switch from object to camera. And then start adding new markers. So for example, we've got something here that we can track. So all these nice little features on the cars are easy to track or should be easy to track. So control T to track that. And of course it stops because the bicycle man is going in front of that. But here we can continue control T or actually no, we shouldn't because the shot is already ending here. 
Okay, so that will take a few minutes and when that is finished then we can continue. So people driving into the shot are always annoying, but that's what you get when you are shooting in public. So over here it should be a little better, so that tracks until the end of the shot. We can continue on tracking the stuff here on the floor and in the foreground. Also here, and well, that is really easy. So I will come back in a few minutes with the finished camera track. Okay, so that should be enough and now we can start solving the camera. So in the camera I just leave these and see what happens, but before I also want to enable refinement. So with the same keyframes, let's see what happens if we solve that. So enable refinement for the camera, then solve the camera motion it is refining and we are at 0 0.3, which is quite good. So now let's have a look at the object. So the object still has that solve error. So now let's see what happens if we solve the object with the new data here. And well, that didn't really help, which is a pity. So let's see what the actual track looks like. So I drag this down, go to the 3D view and well before let's go to the camera and set up a tracking scene. So in the camera first set up the floor, so that could be on the floor, that and that. Then in the reconstruction set this as the floor, then maybe set, I don't know, maybe set this as the origin and then set up tracking scene. So now we've got that. Then also let's establish a size. So maybe that could be one meter. So set scale. And if I look through that. That looks quite okay. So it is rather stable. The cube goes up, GZ1, smaller and to the side. Okay, so that still looks all right. Now let's see what happens with our object. Well, currently I cannot see any object here, but that is because we have still this little bug. So when I go to the object, then here in the reconstruction, you can see that the scale for the object is still set to 0 0.0001. So that should not be the case and hopefully this will soon be fixed. So the default object size should be one. So if I set this to one, then we can see something, but that's not right. So even though we have a solution here, it is totally wrong. So I have to go back and have a look at these markers. So first of all, eventually we will just have to add some more markers. And especially here in cases where there's really not much perspective and not much depth, that is always something that you might want to consider. So in this case, um, maybe we can track something more here. So that seems to be a pretty nice corner. So I will just track that frame by frame carefully. Try to avoid any sliding like here. Okay, so now that we've got 
that. Let's see if that will improve the solution. So shift S and we are still at 2.7. So let's see if we have some other problems. For example, if I go back to the cleanup panel and enter maybe four clean tracks and then see what problems we've got. For example, apparently these ones are problematic, but also this one on the hand. So let's see what happens if I erase that and shift S. That makes things worse. Let's see what happens if I delete the other one on the hand, shift S. And now we are below one, which is a very good sign. And if I look at the solution, yeah, that's exactly what I want. So after a lot of work, we finally have a more or less working object track. And the interesting thing is that even though the single marker might have a bigger error, case you just saw that this one has a bigger error than this one, but erasing that has just led to problems. Now let's see what happens if I erase also this one and solve again. So surprisingly, now we are still below one, but if you look at this solution, now we have a lot of jumps, so that is not correct anymore. So Blender has really needed the perspective information from this marker that we had on the thumb. So even though we are still not near 0 0.5, uh, it is still okay. And if I look at that, that looks reasonably good. And that will be the base for the next work, which would be to add this blaster gun to his arm. But first let's recap the steps that are required to do object tracking and camera tracking. So you can start by tracking the object, so any markers on the object. If you realize that you have been tracking them while you were in camera track mode, then you can copy the tracks by hitting the spacebar and then just type copy. Eventually in the future there might be a button somewhere for that, but you can also always use the spacebar for the search menu. So just make sure that you track the object. When you're finished with that, you can solve that, but you cannot use any refinement for that, because typically the tracks of an object are not good enough to calculate any refinement of focal length. Also the space that is available to do that is probably also very small, like in here. So if you want to do that, then you would also have to track the camera. But if you only want to track the object, then you would just have to enter the focal length manually. You also have to estimate the lens distortion yourself or just don't use it. That's also always possible. The next step, if you only want to do the object, then you have to go to the constraints, add a camera solver to the camera, even though you might not even have a solution for the camera. So just add the solver. And then if you want to attach an object, then just grab any object and add the object solver constraint, enter the correct data here, and then you're all fine. If you also want to track the camera, then to do that you switch to the camera mode, add the markers for the camera, then you can enter the focal length and distortion here, or in that case you can also use the refinement. Also you should set the keyframes correct, so you can do that here, solve the camera, and once you have the moving camera, then you can switch to the object, solve the object with the keyframes, and then it will be automatically attached to the camera. So even if I now grab the tracked and moving camera, everything will still work and be in sort of relation to each other. So that are the basic steps that are required to do object tracking and camera tracking in one step. Now the next would be, of course, to create the proper alignment and orientation. So currently we have that object sitting here, which actually looks pretty good, but if I look at my camera solution, then we can orient ourselves where the object would have to be. And actually it is probably in the right spot. So I just selected these two markers in camera mode and I can see that the corresponding 3D markers are here on the floor. 
the arm is more or less in the right spot. It is somewhere in between these two markers. So this two line indicates where the feet are and he's standing and pushing the arm forward. So that looks more or less okay, but you can still tweak it. So in object mode, maybe let's go full screen here. You can pick two markers where you know the exact distance. And I've measured that. So the distance between this corner of this device and this one, that is about 10 centimeters. So if I know this distance, I can go to the reconstruction mode and then here in the object scale, set the exact distance between these two points. So the scale factor that you can see here, that is still related to the camera solution, but below that you have the object settings. So there's scale and set scale and distance. So this is for the exact measurements, in case you know that, and with a scale factor you can still tweak it. So for example, if I know the distance between these two points, I can now go ahead and in the object panel go to distance and set this to 0.1, then activate set scale, and that moves this object to the exact position where it should be. And that is simply because we also had set the scale for two points on the floor for the camera. And because these are in the same scene, if you set the scale for these two points as well, then of course it will all fit more or less. But if you still want to tweak it, then you can very easily do that. And that is just by going to object scale and then set the scale factor here so with that you can tweak the size and the distance to the camera. And from here it looks all different. So if I drag this slider then this object seems to grow and shrink. But if you look from the camera view that will have no impact on how it appears here on these markers. So if I change the scale it will still look the same. But if I um, divide that and you can see that, in fact, when I'm changing the scale, that it really has an impact. Okay, let me set the scale again. So that is now the correct size, and we can start adding an object to that. Maybe let's start with a very simple object, like a cube. So Shift A, Add Mesh Cube. Scale it down, bring that over here, like that. And after that, of course, you have to add the object solver. Because currently we only see these markers because we also have the camera solver. And now we need to add the object solver to that cube. So add constraints, object solver, then choose the correct object. In this case, that is very easy. So object and the camera is the camera. And where's our cube? It is up there, which of course is not correct. But if you now set the origin to, let's say, this point, then it will snap to that point and will now follow the arm. Also scale it down and rotate until it sticks to the arm, more or less. You can also set this as a certain axis, S, X, X. Let's see, yeah, that looks already good. And now we can play back to see if really everything works as we expect it to be. And it looks fine. Although, did you see that? There was a little jump. So everything seems to work. But then here at frame 45, suddenly everything jumps in the complete opposite direction. So that is just one frame where it jumps and is not correct. And that is a problem that is very typical for object tracking. That happens when on a certain frame the solution or the, the markers could be flipped in both ways. So apparently on frame 44 for the solver the markers look exactly the same uh, in this way as if they would be like or like if they would be flipped to the exact opposite. So even though that has a dramatic jump here in the 3D viewport, when you look through the camera and don't see the cube, 
and also maybe no selection, then it does look exactly the same. So here, at least I cannot see any jumping. Unless you look from the side. So here you can see that there in fact is a big jump, but from the camera perspective it looks exactly the same. Even we have a problem to see if there is a jump or not, then of course the solver will also have a problem to see if there is a jump or not. And in that case we have to try to help Blender to find the perspective and that is by adding more markers, extending existing markers. So the Blender knows where exactly the perspective is and how it should look like. And in that case I think one way to solve that would be to help this red marker here that is going behind this green marker like manually help it during this transition period. Because with that information Blender would really know where is front and where is back and by that we might be able to fix this jump. A little bit of more work but we can easily do that. So grab this marker, Alt left arrow and here we have to manually help it so try to be as close as possible and one way to help you with that is to use the curves. Now, of course in this case you only see the active curve of this one marker um, which doesn't tell you anything but if I hit A then we can see all the other curves and with that we could see if the movement makes sense or not. But if I now hit G to grab, then everything will move, which is not what I want. So in that case, I just select this one marker, then invert the selection with Control i then hit Control l to lock them, and then with A I can select everything again, but if I now hit G, then only this one marker will move, because the rest will be still locked. So with that we can now try to help it along the way and put it to a position where these curves are not too different from the rest of the curves. Of course here in that frame it will look totally different, but that is because in the next frame it is disabled, so there will be no speed. Okay, now on the next frame, G to enable it again and then put it back on track and try to make sure that this is not too different from the rest of the curves. I mean there will be of course some difference, but not too much because that will then indicate that there is a spike and a sudden speed increase and that would lead to problems. But if the movement is more or less similar then you know that uh, it probably makes sense in terms of movement and position. Okay, so now we have closed the gap of this one marker, so with Shift S I solve again and let's have a look if there is still some jumping, but this looks better now. So A to select everything, Alt L to unlock, A to deselect everything and then Alt H in the 3D viewport to show the cube and let's see if this now is any better. And in fact, it seems as if there is no jumping now. So these are the kind of problems that you have to expect when you're doing object tracking and adding an actual object really helps to figure out if it makes sense or not. Now eventually after resolving you might have to do the orientation again. So grab these two. These are 0.1, so set scale, and if you get that error then that means you have to select the camera because that is the object that actually holds the information about the scale and everything. So select the camera, set scale. Now let's see if that really makes sense. So back in the movie clip, let's see, so at frame 43 he's a little bit more behind and walks over. So here the camera, he is between these three and this one, so somewhere around here, and in fact that's where he is. So that makes sense 
And now maybe let's have a look at the orientation, if everything is still correct. So zero to look through the camera, then maybe Z for a wireframe to adjust that a little bit. For example, move that over, trying to make that really um, be at the outside or like wrapping the arm, so to say. Then let's see how long that should be. So if I have a look at this point, then I think that this could be a little bit longer. So along the local x-axis, make that a bit longer, also rotate just a little bit. All right, so that looks okay. Maybe it is a little bit too long. So try to really make it stop at the elbow, like so. And I think that is a good start to now be able to attach the plasma gun.